The ability of enzymes to speed up reactions is actually mind-boggling. The subject of this presentation is to talk about the ways in which we study the kinetics or the ways that enzymes speed up reactions. In this presentation, I will give a little bit of background about the process of catalysis, talk about the flexibility of enzymes and how that enables them to do what they do, talk about activation energy, which is another consideration for enzymatic catalysis, I'll talk about the mechanism of a specific reaction for an enzyme called a serine protease. And then I'll give the kinetic considerations that we have during that analytical process. And finally, talk about the overall uh, overview of using what are called michaelis menten kinetics. Now, when we think about enzymatic reactions, there's actually a, a series of different ways that, that molecules can react in interacting with an enzyme. We can have, for example, a reaction that's a single substrate reaction and a single product. A is converted into B. We can have a reaction in which a single substrate is converted into multiple products. So, for example, if I took A and I split it into two molecules, I would make B and C. I could take multiple substrates and make single products, which is the opposite, which would mean I would be putting two things together to make a third, uh, that third being C as shown here. And last, I could have multiple substrates and multiple products in which A and B are converted into two different things, C and D. Now, uh, enzymes are, as I said, magical in their ability to catalyze reactions, and they are so much faster than a chemical catalyst that it's important to think about the ways in which they're able to accomplish what they accomplish. And so this illustration of an enzymatic reaction goes step by step into some of the considerations for the ways that enzymes accomplish what they do. Chemical catalysts, I want you to remember, are things that are very fixed. A platinum catalyst, for example, has no breathing. It has no movement to it. It simply is a surface on which something can happen. And enzymes are fundamentally different from that. In this illustration, we see an enzyme shown in green, and we see the active site of the enzyme, that is the place where the reaction is catalyzed, shown in light green. Now, the enzyme in this reaction I'm showing you is a reaction of multiple substrates, multiple products. So we will have A and B, as you can see here, that will be converted into two other molecules. We start with the enzyme unloaded. No products, uh, contain, no products on the enzyme and, of course, no substrates. The substrates are the molecules that bind to the enzyme, and they will bind so as to position, be positioned at the place where the reaction occurs, the active site. We can see here the substrates have started to bind to the enzyme. We see the enzyme again in green. We see substrate A that has bound the top portion of the enzyme and substrate B that has bound the bottom. Now the interaction of the substrates with the enzyme will actually cause the enzyme to start to change. This is the Koshland induced fit model of an enzyme. In the Koshland induced fit, it says that not only does the enzyme change the substrates into products, but transiently, during the catalytic process, the substrates change the enzyme. And as we will see, that's essential for this reaction to occur. So the substrate binding has happened. We have formed at this point what we call the ES complex, enzyme substrate complex. Now, in the next step you see right here, what has happened is we see the reaction going on. And the enzyme has actually changed its shape slightly from the initial binding to bring A and B into closer proximity. Well, of course, for a chemical reaction, closeness is an absolutely essential or requirement for the reaction to occur. So the slight change in the shape of the enzyme has converted A and B from being apart to being slightly closer together. These changes of shape can be very large on enzyme terms, or it can be very, very subtle, but nonetheless, the change happens with every reaction. Now, the reaction is occurring again, as we can see, because they have been brought into close proximity. At this point, as the reaction is going on, we have something called the ES star complex, and we can just simply think about this as the place where the reaction is now able to occur. As we look at this uh, reaction closer, we see during the reaction, a part of A has moved from A to B. And this has been a transfer of a part of one substrate to another. A is no longer A, and B is no longer B at this point. We have made what we call the EP complex. We've made the products, but we haven't released the products yet. So A has become C, and B has become D. Now, the products are still contained within the enzyme. But the products are different than A and B were. So just as A and B caused the enzyme to change shape, 
so too will C and D cause the enzyme to change shape. And you can probably see where this is headed. The enzyme's going to go back to where it was. And that's what happens right here. We see in this reaction now that the enzyme has been changed and it's changed back to its initial state. In the initial state, we can think of its fingers being open like my hand is open, and C and D are ready to go flying away. The enzyme now being back in its original state is able to go and bind more substrate. It's ready for the next process. Now if we think about this, our definition of a catalyst that everybody learns in freshman chemistry is a molecule or an entity that catalyzes a reaction but is unchanged in the process. That's a principle that is hammered into every freshman chemistry student. Now we see that enzymes are actually slightly violating that principle. They're being changed transiently during the process, but they end up in the, in the end in the same way they started. So overall, they're not violating it, but they cheat a bit. We see in this slide then a summary of all the reactions or the steps in the process that you've seen before. And I don't want to go through those again, but I do want to make the point that you notice that the arrows are going both ways. And that means that this reaction and every step in this reaction is reversible. Now, reversibility of a reaction is a very important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about metabolic processes, or for that matter, even non-metabolic processes, but especially for metabolic processes because we have to think that is, what are the conditions that would make something go backwards? We've seen how enzyme flexibility enables enzymes to accomplish what they accomplish, but enzymes do have constraints that they have to work in. I've mentioned in these presentations numerous times now that Enzymes and cells all are governed by the rules, rules of the universe. That is, they can't change the energies of reactions. And so those are true for cells and those are also true for enzymes. Now, enzymes, as we will see, are tricky little things. I've mentioned how enzymes cheat and enzymes are going to cheat with respect to energy as well. So let's consider a reaction of A going to B. In A going to B, this is plotted from an energy perspective on the screen, what you see here. On the left side of the screen, we see a dot placed on the graph showing free energy. That is the energy that's associated with molecule A. In the process of going from A to B, we see that there is a uh, change in the energy, that, it, that the energy is actually increased, and we call this increase in energy, the activation, activation energy, energy that's necessary to get a reaction going. The reaction proceeds, and as the reaction proceeds, we can see that the free energy falls so that we make a product, B, that down by the end has a lower free energy than A had. That meant that energy was released in the process of going from A to B, and this makes this, energy, this, this reaction process favorable. Now, it's important to note that this change in free energy that's shown right here, this change in free energy, cannot be changed by an enzyme. That is, there's no change between the starting and ending points of the enzyme. The enzyme does some other things, however. It's also important to note here that this height of the peak is really a critical place. The height of this peak is the place where the reaction can reverse and go backwards from where it came. That is, A can start and then go back. Or B, if it got enough energy, could climb that curve and then go back to A. Otherwise, A is going to go forward to B, and the reaction is going to be is going to be favor is going to be um, uh, occurring. Now, enzymes cheat. Okay, enzymes can change the activation energy. There are no rules about activation energy. Okay, there are rules about beginning and ending energies. But what activation energies changes do is they enable an enzyme to make more molecules more easily go through that transition. That is the magic of enzymes. How do they accomplish that? Well, they accomplish this in a couple of ways. One of the ways that they do it is by the fact that they have binding sites that are very precisely oriented so that the molecules are placed into close proximity that they randomly would not be into close proximity so easily. Uh, so easily. All right? And that means that it takes less energy for them to go through the next step in the process. By doing this, enzymes can actually lower the activation energy and make it possible for a reaction to go easier and also to go faster, meaning it's therefore much more likely that the reaction from A to B will be catalyzed. You notice again, enzymes have had no change in overall free energy. The energy of A is still A. The energy of B is still B. Okay? Only that transitional state has made a difference.
Now, I want to go through and spend some time talking about the mechanism of, of an enzymatic reaction. Mechanism is important to consider because with mechanism, we can begin to see how enzymes are facilitating electronic changes necessary for a chemical reaction to occur. The example I will use is an example of a serine protease. A serine proteases are a class of enzymes that cut proteins. They break peptide bonds. That's what they do. And they break not every peptide bond they see, but they break specific peptide bonds at specific places within the proteins that they bind to. All right, so that means that they have binding specificity. They don't, they don't cut everything that they see. Serine proteases have flexibility. So we saw in the initial illustration the flexibility of an enzyme, and we're going to see it occurring again here as we talk about the mechanism of the serine protease. The electronic environment is very critical for a reaction. In a chemical reaction, electrons are being manipulated, electrons are being moved around, and to be able to do that, one must have the environment for those electrons to readily be able to move around, and we'll see that happening in the active site of the serine protease. Enzymes also use coenzymes. Now, in this reaction, in this um, uh, example I'm going to give, I won't show a coenzyme, but I will say that coenzymes actually help an enzyme to accomplish what it accomplishes. Now, Serine proteases, as I said, cleave peptide bonds. That's the catalytic action and catalytic thing that they do. They have specificity of cutting, again, by binding only to certain molecules, certain proteins, they only cut those proteins that they bind. They have a common active site. All the serine proteases, the different serine proteases, have a three-dimensional configuration of the place in them where the reaction occurs. Now, we'll see that that is important because that configuration is what creates the electronic environment necessary for the reaction to take place. And last of all, the serine proteases are very well studied, so we understand the mechanism of their action quite well. So let's take a look now at the mechanism of a serine proteases. I've shown on the screen here a uh, substrate uh, for the enzyme. This is a polypeptide chain or protein that the, subs that the uh, serine protease will cut. The specific cut that's going to occur here will occur between the carbon and the nitrogen on this molecule. And of course, you know from uh, the structures we've talked about in other presentations, this is the location of the peptide bond. Now, on the right side of this, of this image, you can see the central part of a serine protease. Now, the central part is the place here where the reaction is going to be catalyzed. Now, it's a little hard to get our head around some of these things, so you're going to see in some cases I'm going to stretch bonds and stretch molecules a little bit to actually make things fit so you can understand this. Please understand that in an enzyme itself, of course, they're already better positioned, but it's hard with figures to make things fit as we would like to. Serine proteases all have a common feature of their active site. And the common feature that they have of their active site is that they all contain these three amino acid side chains that you can see located in close proximity of each other. Now, I always like to remind students that when we see something like this, it reminds us that protein folding does occur. That is that serine and histidine and aspartic acid, which are the three side chains that we see here, are not located close to each other in primary sequence. They're brought into close proximity of each other by the folding of the enzyme to make them physically close to each other as we see here. And the closeness of these is important to start, but more importantly, the flexibility of the enzyme with these side chains is absolutely essential to the catalytic function that will happen. Okay, so we imagine now that we see this folded enzyme and that the rest of the enzyme is shown in yellow. We're looking right now specifically at the active site. Near the active site, we have a, uh, a place where the protein is going to bind and the protein that's going to be cut is going to be uh, interacted with this catalytic triad of serine, histidine, and aspartic acid. The binding of the substrate to the enzyme occurs in a specialized site on the enzyme called the S1 pocket. So we've shown here the S1 pocket is a sort of a semicircle that's holding on to a part of that protein. We can see the protein that's going to be cut now is at the active site. Now, in the binding of this protein to the active site, you notice that the nitrogen on the histidine has an arrow pointing towards the, towards the hydroxide. We also note that the 
oxygen that's on the side chain of aspartic acid is has a little dot next to the the uh, hydrogen on the histidine. What's happened here? Well, in going from the previous slide to this slide, we can see that what's happened is the enzyme has changed shape very slightly. The binding of the substrate, and remember that binding of substrate changes enzymes, has changed the enzyme very slightly so that the proximity of aspartic acid's side chain to histidines has changed. That's very important. Aspartic acid here, the oxygen has a negative charge. And the negative charge has moved a little bit closer to the ring of, a, of the histidine as shown here. By this small action, the electronic configuration of the ring of histidine is changed. And it's that change which is causing now the nitrogen to be reaching out. And what it's going to do is it's going to grab that hydrogen that's on serine. Okay? So this tiny change in shape that happened on the binding of the enzyme is starting the process by which the reaction is going to occur. So we can see here that the S1 pocket has facilitated all this happening. I should say in the S1 pocket that the S1 pocket gives the specificity of the enzyme. The S1 pocket will not bind to everything. It will bind to specific proteins with specific sequences within them. Very, very important concept. If it doesn't encounter those specific things, it won't bind them. And if it won't bind them, of course, there's nothing to react, and the end, this process will not occur. Okay, so the slight structural changes have happened, and we now see the result of this uh, starting to come into play. The, things that the, the entities have moved closer into each other. The electronic environment has definitely changed by this point. And what we see is that that proton that was on the OH of serine is now associated with the nitrogen of the histidine ring. Now, this is the first step in this catalytic process, or actually the second step if we count the binding of the substrate. This making of the oxygen with a negative charge on the end of serine is fundamental to this reaction occurring. We call this negatively charged oxygen on serine an alkoxide ion. Okay? That alkoxide ion that's on serine is extraordinarily reactive. It's ready to go do business. Now, we've stretched that S1 pocket a little bit to remind us that, again, we're bringing things into closer proximity. And that is important because the alkoxide ion is looking for something to bind to. It's looking for a nucleus. It's what we call a nucleophile. And the nucleus that it's looking for here is this carbon, which is the arrow that's being pointed from the oxygen minus down to the orange carbon. So there is actually what's called a chemical attack, a nucleophilic attack that's occurring on that carbon. We can see that the electrons that are double bonded to the oxygen are rearranging as we see the arrow being pointed. And in the next step of the process, what will happen is that we're going to see a rearrangement in the molecule. Okay? So we went from this position to this position. Notice that we had a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen that now is a carbon with a single bond to an oxygen. That molecule is chemically unstable. It's chemically unstable, and a chemically unstable molecule has to be dealt with. Because if it's not dealt with, it's going to cause problems. Well, the enzyme has another pocket in it to deal with that unstable molecule. It's called the oxyanion hole. And the oxyanion hole helps that unstable molecule to fall apart without problem. That's pretty cool. Okay? It's going to fall apart without problem. And what's going to happen here, as you can see, is the nitrogen in blue is going to reach up and grab that hydrogen that was originally grabbed by the histidine side chain. Okay, So this intermediate that's in the oxyanion hole is what we call a tetrahedral. Okay, And tetrahedrals we know from organic chemistry are what happens when carbon has those four bonds that you can see here. Okay, The peptide bond, which is between the carbon and the nitrogen, okay, is, is going to be broken as a result of nitrogen grabbing that hydrogen. Here, nitrogen has grabbed the hydrogen. The grabbing of the hydrogen from the histidine caused the bond between the carbon and the nitrogen to break. So we've broken the peptide bond. And so part of the protein, 
the part of the protein shown in blue, is now free to go and do its business. It's released. There's nothing attaching it to the enzyme, and it goes and it exits. What we have done here is we have actually gone through the first part of the reaction. And in this part of the reaction is what we call the rapid part of the reaction. Okay? The other part of the uh, protein is attached to serine. It's physically attached to serine. It's a covalent bond at this point. Now that covalent bond has to be broken in order for the other part of the original protein to be released. And that's what's going to happen in the slow step of catalysis. Now the slow step of catalysis actually has about the same number of steps as the fast step of catalysis, but other things have to happen, including the movement of water into the active site in order for the, this uh, peptide to be released. Well, we see that happening here. Water now has physically moved into the active site. There's a, a molecule of water. And that process that we saw of the nitrogen on histidine taking a proton is going to repeat itself. We see it happening here. We see the arrow from the nitrogen on the histidine pointing to the hydrogen on water. So it's going to take that hydrogen instead of taking the hydrogen that it originally took, which is no longer there, on serine. What's going to happen in that process is now we're going to have an activated oxygen, like we had with the alkoxide ion, except for here it's going to be a hydroxide. We're going to have an activated oxygen that's going to make a nucleophilic attack on carbon just like we saw before. So there's a nucleophilic attack that's going to happen in the process of this moving forward. Here's the attack of the hyd hydroxide. And look what happens. We see that the electrons on oxygen are going to rearrange. We create a, 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 a tetrahedral intermediate as we created before. And now, there's the oxyanion hole stabilizing that intermediate. We now see that what happens is that oxygen is going to attack the hydrogen on that group and it's going to pull it away just like the first peptide did. When it does that, what happens is the molecule is released, so we see the second half of the polypeptide chain released, and in addition, we have the, the enzyme returned back to its original state. Gone, and as it were. The cycle is now complete. So there's about 10 steps going through what I've described here. And the important thing to understand about this is that the enzyme started in one state, it went through a transition, and then went back to the original state it was in. Very much like the process I've already described, but now you've seen it in mechanistic terms. When we saw the image of the reaction occurring, we saw these various states that you see on the screen. The enzyme plus the substrate bound together to make the ES complex, which converted upon the change in the enzyme to the ES star complex, which created the EP, or the enzyme product complex, which ultimately resulted in the release of the enzyme in the product. Now I come back to this because we are going to need to consider some things about the kinetic parameters, that is the, uh, the um, um, speed uh, parameters of the reactions that we're going to study. Now, this rate of formation of product is really what we're interested in. When we talk about how fast an enzyme can make a reaction occur, this is the guts of what we're after. We want to know how fast is the enzyme able to do this. Well, if to do this, we need to make some simple um, assumptions. And so we assume in the simple case that the enzyme substrate complex proceeds directly to enzyme plus product. Okay. So when it, we've simplified this more complicated equation above to a simpler uh, equation below, and this is done to help us better understand what's going on in the, in the overall mechanism. Now, these constants that are here won't really enter into our uh, consideration, but the KCAT that you see in the enzyme going to E plus P will, in fact, be an important consideration for us as we talk about the kinetic parameters. The KCAT, as we shall see, is the rate with which product is forming. Now, let's consider what's happening inside uh, of a couple of different scenarios of a reaction. We can imagine that we have enzymes, for example, shown in yellow, and we have substrates as little red colored balls that are there. We could have a situation, first of all, where we have a reaction going on in a condition of low substrate. And if we have a low amount of substrate in a solution, we could imagine that there's very few enzymes that are going to be bound to substrate because the chances of encountering a substrate are reduced.
In the middle, of course, we have an intermediate state where we have a little bit higher concentration of substrate than we did before. And so we can see here that there are more enzyme molecules bound to and engaged in the process of making uh, the product. And the third scenario we could imagine is high substrate. And when we have a situation of high substrate, we notice here that every enzyme is bound to a substrate. And that's important because at high substrate concentrations, we have enzymes that are what we call saturated with substrate. Meaning that once it has bound a substrate, made a product, and released it, almost instantaneously, it grabs another substrate. It's not sitting around and waiting for things. Now, so enzymes, interestingly, have some um, um, kinetic uh, considerations, which is, of course, what we're interested in studying here. But we see now, for the first time, a projection of the way that the enzyme is working. So I need to explain some things on the graph that you see. First of all, we're plotting on this graph a reaction. The reaction is plotting the velocity of the reaction on the y-axis versus the substrate concentration that's used in the reaction on the x-axis. Now you notice the V has a little zero beneath it, and the zero beneath it I'll explain later, but it's called the initial velocity for, uh, for our purposes. The velocity of a reaction is measured as the concentration of product made divided by time the concentration of product made per time. Well, we measure concentration in molar, millimolar, micromolar, etc. So that would be some molarity per time. That is how velocity is measured. The substrate concentration varies because to generate a curve like this, I do not one reaction, but I do a series of reactions. So let me set that up. We can imagine, for example, that I'm setting up a series of 20 reactions, 20 different test tubes. I want to measure the velocity in each one of those test tubes. And what I do is I take into that test tube, I place the buffer that holds the uh, substrate, I place the substrate, and I place the enzyme. Now, when I'm doing an experiment, I want to have one variable because one variable is the only thing I can really uh, manipulate and measure the effect of that. The variable I have here is substrate concentration. I use the same amount of enzyme in every tube. All 20 tubes have the same amount of enzyme. They all have the same amount of buffer, and they have varying amounts of substrate, starting from very small amounts to very high amounts. I take and I let each one react for an exact same time, and then I measure the amount of product. So by doing that, I can see the effect of measuring of changing substrate on the velocity, and then I plot it. So what you see on the screen is the sum of those plots. That is, each each point on that on that dot came from a series of reactions that I did. And each one of those individual reactions had a specific substrate concentration and a specific velocity that was reached. Well, not surprising as we look at this, what do we see? Well, on the far left, we're at low substrate concentration. What's the velocity? It's very low. And that's what I showed on the, on the original uh, image. Low substrate concentration. Enzyme is sitting there waiting for substrate. There's not going to be much velocity. When I get to a high substrate concentration, such as I see on the right side of the screen, I've got a high velocity. Makes sense. Okay, low substrate, low velocity. High substrate, high velocity. I want you to remember that. Now I'm showing you another plot here to illustrate a principle uh, of a reaction. On the y-axis, I have the concentration of product. We could think of that again as velocity. But on the x-axis now, I'm plotting the time of a reaction. So I could take one of the tubes that I used in the previous one, and for example, look at how fast the product is being accumulated and what happens to that product over time. Well, we can see on this plot that over the early range of the reaction, there's a linear relationship between the production of product and time. Okay? But after a while, what happens is that that curve flattens off. Now, what that means is that the longer that we let a reaction go, it doesn't stay linear forever. And the reason it doesn't stay linear forever, because remember, enzymes catalyze reversible reactions. So the more we let product accumulate, the more likely product will start being converted back into substrate. Well, that's not what we're interested in studying. We want to study how fast the enzyme makes product. So if we're going to study an enzymatic reaction, 
we have to study what's called initial velocity. We don't want to wait too long in order to study the concentration of product. Because if we wait too long, we're actually starting to study the reverse reaction. And that's not what we're after. So that's why we use VO, or the initial velocity, in our measurements. Now, this is kind of complicated, so I want to step you through it. But these are considerations for doing reactions in what are called Michaelis-Menten kinetics. We can see here that on the uh, y-axis, again, we have concentration. And on the x-axis, we have time. And before, we saw simply the accumulation of product as shown in the orange um, uh, icon here. At the very beginning of a reaction, what is, are the circumstances? Well, we have four different things to think about that can be measured. We have the concentration of substrate. We have the concentration of the enzyme. We have the concentration of the enzyme substrate complex. And ultimately, we're going to have concentration of product, which is what we're interested in studying. Okay. At the beginning, the concentration of product is low, as you can see. And that's not surprising, because the reaction hasn't had a chance to get started. The concentration of ES is low, because there hasn't been an opportunity for the substrate to really encounter the enzyme very much. The concentration of the free enzyme, that is the enzyme not bound to substrate, is relatively high. You see it's coming down from the y-axis. And finally, the concentration of substrate is high, because none of the substrate has reacted. So at the time zero, we have these circumstances going on, and these circumstances turn out not to be ideal for us to measure the enzymatic reaction. Now, as the reaction proceeds, we see changes to these entities. We see, first of all, that the concentration of substrate by the end of the reaction is low, and it's falling during the entire process. The concentration of the ES substrate, which started out at zero, is going higher, and we'll see that it will eventually sort of level off. We also see that the concentration of the free enzyme, which started out at a relatively high position, is falling. And it, too, will sort of level off uh, in time. And finally, we see, of course, that the concentration of product is going to start at the low and go to high by the very end. Well, I show you this graph not to complicate the picture too much, hopefully, but rather to demonstrate what we try to do in studying enzymatic reactions. In the very initial phase, I hope I've made the case for you that we're in a set of conditions called pre-steady state. Now, I'll explain what steady state means in a minute, but we have a cir circumstance where the reaction hasn't had a chance to get started, the enzyme isn't doing its thing, and everything in there is changing pretty rapidly. The change in substrate, the change in enzyme, the change in enzyme-substrate complex, and the change in product. This is going to give us a lot of variability in a reaction. Now, I said we want to study initial velocity. But we want to be careful if we do it too soon, we may not get what we're after here. So it's important to think about really studying a, studying a reaction at a place where these things have sort of leveled off. Now, under conditions of steady state, what's actually happening is that these other quantities that were varying fairly rapidly in the very initial phase of the reaction will start to even out. And that's very important for our consideration. So we can see, for example, that in that early state, the concentration of free enzyme and ES complex are changing. The concentration of E is falling very rapidly, and the concentration of ES is rising very rapidly. However, in under steady state conditions, as we can see here, they have started to flatten out. They're not exactly linear, but they're much closer to linear than they were in that pre-steady state condition. That turns out to be important for us, because what we're interested in studying is the conversion of enzyme substrate complex into product. And so if we have a relatively constant concentration of enzyme substrate complex, then that decay or that falling into product that's actually happened is happening at a, co a relatively constant rate. That's the place we want to be, and that's why it's important for us to be studying these reactions under steady state conditions. Steady state conditions, of course, again, meaning that these quantities are not varying significantly. Now, we can see now the overall plot of what's happening on here. The steady state conditions are where we make our measurements, and we see that this relatively linear portion of the plot for the concentration of free enzyme and concentration of ES complex uh, is happening under the conditions that we measure our enzymatic reactions. Okay, under Michaelis-Menten kinetics, we um, learned that it's important for us to study enzymatic reactions under conditions where our steady state, that is, we have relatively constant amounts of ES complex. 
Under Michaelis Menten kinetics, the equation on the, on the top applies, and this equation tells us some very important things that we're going to learn in this lecture. Now, VO, that is the velocity of a reaction, is equal to V max, and that's something that we'll discuss in a moment, times the concentration of substrate, divided by another quantity called Km that we'll discuss, plus the concentration of substrate. So we've learned two terms here that are going to become important for us to understand, and that's V max, the maximum velocity of a reaction, and Km, which is a quantity that allows us to measure the affinity that an enzyme has for its substrate. Well, first let's start with Vmax. With Vmax, it's important uh, to, uh, to understand what it is and why it is and how that happens. We saw when we plotted VO versus the concentration of substrate be below that we saw that the curve grew and then it, it, it leveled off. And the reason it levels off is due to the way that enzymes work and the way that they interact with substrates. Instead of an enzymatic reaction going and staying linear uh, with increasing concentrations of substrate, what happens is enzymes get saturated with substrate. Saturation of substrate means that the enzyme by is almost constantly bound to substrate, meaning that we have almost everything in the ES complex. So at very high substrate concentrations, the enzyme is continually releasing product. And over time, if we add more and more substrate, we exceed the capacity of the enzyme to bind more substrate. So under saturating conditions of substrate, the enzyme is no longer able to uh, stay linear and it flattens off. So we see this hyperbolic plot. Now, an example might be a factory that's making products. A factory that's making products will have a lot of workers. And that those workers are working on something, but if they don't have enough materials to make product, then the workers are going to be standing around a fair amount of the time waiting uh, for materials so they can make product. On the other hand, we could imagine that if we have those same workers working and they have all the, pro all the materials they need to make products, they're going to turn out a certain number of products per day. If we increase the amount of materials, but we don't increase the number of workers, we're not going to change that maximum amount they're going to get. So we see the same thing happening in the real world that we see happening with enzymatic reactions. If we want to increase the amount of product, we have to get more workers, perhaps get another factory in order to make more product. Now, enzymes that don't follow michaelis menten kinetics, and there are some, include those that bind substrates cooperatively. Now, in another presentation, I talked about how hemoglobin binds to oxygen cooperatively. And that means that the binding of one substrate is affecting the binding of others. So when we, this happens, and of course this only happens for multi-subunit -sub proteins, when this happens, when the binding of one affects the others, then of course we're going to see a change in the velocity because that's going to change the actual binding conditions uh, of the enzyme. When we have those things happen, we can tell them pretty easily because what we will get is an S-shaped curve for the V versus S plot, very much like what we saw with the um, hemoglobin binding to oxygen. Okay, well, let's now look at these parameters. I've introduced the concept of Vmax, and we see that eventually the enzyme reaches a place where it's not going to make any more product over time because it's saturated with substrate. Vmax turns out to be an interesting quantity, um, but Vmax, as we will see, has some limitations. Nonetheless, Vmax allows us to study some things. Now, the quantity Vmax gives us a maximum amount. And we could say, well, if we want to understand how much an enzyme interacts with a substrate, maybe we should compare Vmaxes. Well, that doesn't really tell us very much. It tells us how fast a reaction goes, but it doesn't tell us how well an enzyme interacts with a substrate. Because any enzyme will reach Vmax as we add an infinite amount of substrate, which is theoretically what Vmax uh, is occurring at when it's completely saturated. That doesn't tell us much. However, the quantity Vmax over 2, where we're getting an enzyme to a certain point of velocity, but not the maximum amount of velocity, actually allows us to measure that the affinity that enzyme has for its substrate. If we compare a variety of enzymes and we compare how much substrate it requires the enzyme to get to Vmax over 2, we get something very interesting. We get a quantity called the Km. And the Km is actually a measure of the enzyme's affinity for its substrate. And so when I say affinity, it's the desire to bind to.
How well does it bind to its substrate? Now, KM is interesting. If we think about two enzymes, one enzyme that catalyzes a reaction that has great affinity for its substrate. It really likes that substrate. It really grabs that substrate. And we have another enzyme over here that doesn't like its substrate as well. Okay? Well, which of the two are going to bind substrate more readily? The first one, of course, because it's got greater affinity. Which one is going to get to Vmax over 2 with a lower substrate concentration? Well, the one that grabs its substrate more easily. So enzymes that have a greater affinity for their substrate are going to have a low KM. And those that have less affinity for their substrate are going to have a higher KM. Okay? Greater affinity, low KM. Lower affinity, high KM. So KM is inversely proportional to the enzyme's affinity for its substrate. Okay? So here we see high KM, low affinity. We see low KM, high affinity. A very important concept to remember with respect to KM. And I like to think about it about an enzyme that has low affinity. We have to pound it on the head with substrate before it starts to bind it. And by pounding it on the head, the way that we do that is by adding a lot more um, substrate. Now, Vmax, as I said, is a very interesting and important quantity, but it actually is not the perfect quantity to measure uh, the speed of a reaction. It's good for the reaction, but it's not so good for the enzyme. So what does that mean? Well, it means that Vmax, um, it, when we do a reaction, the way I describe doing a reaction is we set up 20 tubes, and we have in those 20 tubes buffer, we have substrate, and we have enzyme. And when we're doing a V versus S plot, what we're doing is we're having one variable. And the one variable that we have is substrate, which means that all 20 tubes have the same amount of enzyme. That's great. We don't want to have variable amounts of enzyme. But imagine I were to do the same set of reactions, and instead of using the amount I used in the first set, Let's say that I did the reaction and I used twice the amount of enzyme for the second set of reactions. In each case, constant, however. Varying substrate, but now with twice the amount of enzyme. What would I see with respect to Vmax? Well, if I go back to my factory analogy and I think about what happened with the factory, I said that the factory got to a point where it's saturated. It made a maximum amount of product that the workers are going to put out per day and it wasn't going to make any more. What if I had two factories? Well, if I have two factories, I would say, well, I'd probably expect that I would get twice as much product per day. And so if I use a set of tubes that have twice as much enzyme, the parallel follows. I would get twice as much product. So Vmax is proportional to the amount of enzyme I used. It's not a constant for an enzyme, but it's a constant only for a reaction with a set amount of enzyme. I'd like to be able to compare enzymes with a quantity that is independent of the amount of enzyme that I used. Well, fortunately, that's fairly easy to do. Okay? Vmax is a velocity, and we measure velocity of a reaction as the concentration of the product produced divided by time. If I take the quantity of enzyme that I used in the reaction, and I divide Vmax by that quantity, I say quantity, in this case meaning concentration, the concentration of enzyme that I used, what will happen? Well, the Vmax was measured as a concentration of product, and I divide by a concentration of enzyme. As long as I use concentration and concentration consistently, the concentrations actually drop out. And so what happens is I get a number, and the units on the number are per time. So I get something that says 1,000 per second. What does 1,000 per second mean? Well, I've taken the enzyme out of the equation, and now the number that I get corresponds to the number of molecules of product per enzyme per second. So 1,000 per second means every enzyme in that solution is making 1,000 molecules of product per second. And that's the fastest it's going to go, because remember, we started with Vmax. That quantity is called KCAT. KCAT is a number that's also called the turnover number. But I can compare the KCATs of two enzymes and have a much better understanding about the relative speeds of production of product that those enzymes have. Now, the idea of KCAT brings up another thing for us to think about. And enzymes are really remarkable. Okay? We've seen that enzymes can speed up reactions mind-boggling numbers of times. 
And we've also introduced the concept here of an enzyme having affinity for its substrate. The idea of what a perfect enzyme would mean, okay, starts to come into shape. We think about, well, what would be a perfect enzyme? A perfect enzyme would be an enzyme that would have as much velocity as possible with as great of affinity for its substrate as possible, meaning that to get to that maximum velocity, it wouldn't take very much substrate because the enzyme would be grabbing substrate and converting it into product very readily. So a perfect enzyme would have a high velocity and a low Km. Well, we use Kcat as our measure of velocity, and Km is our measure of affinity for substrate. High, Kat means high, velo high Kcat means high velocity, Low Km means high affinity. The perfect enzyme will have a large ratio of Kcat to Km. So if we take those two numbers and we divide them by each other and we start comparing enzymes, we see enzymes have widely varying ratios of Kcat over Km. But we also see that there's a sort of a top echelon beyond which enzymes really don't have a number that increases very much. Now, these numbers vary a little bit from each other, but these are really the top echelon enzymes. They don't have a Kcat over Km value that's significantly different. These are on the order of 10 to the 7th to, in one case, 10 to the 9th, but most of them are in the range of about 10 to the 8th. We don't see enzymes that make it to 10 to the 15th, for example. Why is that? Well, what's happened with these enzymes is they've reached their maximum um, efficiency. They can't get any more efficient. There's two things that limit them. One is they can't, with shape and sequence of amino acids, make a better active site than what they've made by evolution. In that sense, they literally are perfect. Mutations that change those will always make an enzyme that's less efficient. There's a limit to what that efficiency can be. And the second thing is really interesting. It is believed that the reason that we reach a max with this, in addition to what I've just mentioned, is that there's something else that's limiting about the enzymatic reaction. And the limiting thing for these enzymes in a solution is one, one quantity, and that's the rate with which the substrate can diffuse in water. Diffusion, of course, happens with the mixing that we see. And it's diffusion that's bringing substrate into the enzyme's active site. And though that process of diffusion can itself occur at mind-boggling rates, that's what allows enzymes to do what they do, it too has a limit. And so these enzymes are so efficient that they're sitting there waiting on water to deliver substrate to them. That's a remarkable thing. All right, let's take and use now some of these parameters that we've uh, been talking about with respect to kinetics and understand enzymatic reactions. I've shown several times now the plot of VO versus S, and we saw that was a hyperbolic curve. And you saw in that curve that at the very top of that, we had something called Vmax. And if I'm eyeballing that curve, I have to ask myself, well, have I drawn Vmax at the right place? Is it up a little bit? Is it down a little bit? And I have to make a judgment call with that. I'd like to have a more precise way of saying, what is the Vmax? Well, one of the, the tricks or tools that we use to do this is to actually change the analysis of the data a little bit. Instead of plotting, one, instead of plotting VO versus the concentration of substrate, that is the velocity versus the concentration of substrate, I take the same data that I had for that VO versus S plot, and I invert it. I invert all the data. So I do what's called a double reciprocal plot, or a line weaver burke plot. They were the people who came up with this. And when I invert the data like that, what I discover is that that hyperbolic plot becomes linear. And that linear plot is much more easy for us to interpret to, to determine what these values are. When I make such a double reciprocal plot, I create a linear uh, plot of the data. And the linear plot of the data, I can use a line, I can draw a line through the, the points and extrapolate through the axes, the y axis and the x axis. When I do, I create an intercept on a y axis, and the y axis has the value of 1 over Vmax. I can very quickly, of course, invert that value, and I've got Vmax. On the x axis, the intercept is minus 1 over Km. So if I take whatever that value of the intercept is and I take minus 1 over that, I will get Km. 
Very simple plot. So line weaver Burt plots, and there are other manipulations that people do of graphs. Line weaver Burt plots help me to re very readily determine Vmax and Km from a set of data. I've described so far how enzymes are flexible around the active site and how that flexibility at the active site facilitates the catalytic process that happens. But enzymes are flexible all over, and that flexibility all around the enzyme gives the enzyme some interesting properties as regards its activity. Now we can see here on the left an enzyme that is getting ready to bind a substrate as we've seen before, and on the right we see the enzyme after having bound the substrate has ad adapted itself to the shape of the enzyme. This was the induced fit that I've been referring to. To. This induced fit it makes a lot of sense for the uh, active site, as I said, but the rest of the enzyme is also affected by these things, by these, by these interactions. Now, this is actually manifests itself in the plot that's shown on this figure right here. On this plot, we can see the V versus S uh, binding for an enzyme that's allosteric. Now, I'll remind you that allosteric means that the enzyme is interacting with a small molecule and having its activity affected. In this case, the small molecule that it's interacting with that's affecting it is actually its substrate. So this happens with multi-subunit enzymes. Now what I'm getting ready to describe very much parallels what I talked about with hemoglobin's binding of oxygen in another of the presentations. When hemoglobin binds to oxygen, you may recall that the binding changed as the oxygen concentration increased. As the oxygen concentration increased, hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen went from low to high, and that was important for the action of hemoglobin. The same thing can happen with an enzyme whose affinity can change depending on its binding of the allosteric, uh, in, in terms of its binding of the substrate that affects it allosterically. Now, multi-subunit enzymes have this happen because a part of one, one part of the enzyme binds the substrate and affects the binding of the substrate on other parts of the enzyme. Now, there, this change that I've described to you results in a change in the overall physical shape of the enzyme, not just the catalytic site. Now, this overall change of the enzyme is given a couple of names. First, we talk about a state that's relaxed. It's called the R state. The relaxed state of an enzyme is the state that really the enzyme is open to binding substrate and is very able to bind substrate. The relaxed state of an enzyme corresponds to a more active state of the enzyme. By contrast, the T state of an enzyme, where T stands for tight, is the enzyme is tense, it is tight, it is not flexible, and it is not able to bind substrate as well. On this plot, for example, we can see at the low substrate concentrations, the enzyme is in the T state. It's not binding substrate very well, but once the substrate concentration gets high enough, the enzyme flips, and then it's able to bind substrate better. So its velocity change actually flips. We don't see the hyperbolic plot that we saw before. Well, there's a couple of ways people have studied and tried to explain this phenomenon going on. So I want to spend a little time going through and explaining ways that we, we uh, interpret this uh, change. They're called the concerted model and the sequential model. So the first of these I'll talk about here is the concerted model. The concerted model is conceptually a little hard to get one's head around. We see the enzyme in this model existing in two states, and for the purpose of this illustration, we've assumed that this enzyme has four subunits. Uh, enzymes can have many, many subunits, uh, up to at least a dozen subunits in some cases, but for this illustration, it has four. In the T state, we have the enzyme shown in the squares on the top, and the T state, we recall, is the least favored of the states. The circles below refer to the enzyme in the R state, where the enzyme is relaxed and more able and likely to bind substrate. What the concerted model says is that the flipping between the T state and the R state happens completely as, as, as shown. That is, we go from the top to the bottom, and there's no intermediate. And what this model says is something that seems counterintuitive, because this model says that the flipping from T to R is not caused by the binding of the substrate, but rather the R state or the T state is favored by whatever the, the, the state it happens to be in when it binds substrate. So if I have an enzyme that flips into the R state and it binds substrate, the substrate will lock it in the R state so that it will tend to stay in the R state and consequently be more reactive. If the enzyme binds it in the T state, it's likely to stay in the T state. 
once the enzyme is in the R state, it's going to stay there and keep producing. And since the R state is producing more and more of the product, anything that favors or locks in the R state is going to favor the reaction more. So the concerted model is um, an all or none. But the locking into one state or another is central to what it does. You can see here that there's an equilibrium between the two, and the equilibrium shifts as we get more of the substrate binding uh, or locking it into a given state. As we go further to the right, the R state is favored because there's more enzymes now in that R state, and more enzymes means more product. The R states can flip, as I said, independently of each other, but the bound state is favoring, in this case, the R state. Now, the other model that we call the sequential model is very much like what we saw when I described the uh, flipping or the changing of hemoglobin. We also refer to the states R state and T state and hemoglobin, but we more commonly use this as regards enzymes. Now, in this model, what happens is we have an enzyme that starts out in the T state, is shown in the, in the four squares on the left. The binding of the first substrate causes one of the subunits of the enzyme to flip. And that's shown in blue in the second uh, model from the left. When that flipping occurs, the blue interacts with the other two units of the enzyme. And we can see that there's a sort of a purple that happens and a rounding of those two. That's indicating that the blue circle, which is in the R state, is affecting the two units around it and causing them to start to flip into the R state. Well, the starting to flip favors the binding of more substrate, and so we can see sequentially then that the uh, blues are becoming more dominant as we get farther to the right. The binding of the substrate is a, a critical thing for this, um, this enzyme because the binding of the substrate in this model says it's the cause of the flip. Now, casually when we talk about it, we frequently say, well, this causes the enzyme to do this or that. And when we say that, we're sort of loose in the language that we use. In this case, the cause is physically causing the flipping to occur. In the concerted model, the cause is not a direct, but it's an indirect as a result of the locking that I described. So the distinguishing difference between the concerted model and the sequential model is that cause that I mentioned. Causing the, the flipping is a physical causing. The two models that I've just described, the concerted model and the uh, sequential model, are just that. They're just models in terms of explaining how the T state and the R states come to be within enzymes. It's very likely uh, that no enzyme actually uses exclusively one or the other, and there's a lot of evidence that enzymes may use as sort of a hybrid of these two models. Enzymes, as I noted at the beginning, can bind reactions in different ways. And I talked about one substrate going to one product, or two substrates going to one product, or in the case I'm going to describe here, two substrates going to two products. Now, when we think of two substrates that can bind to an enzyme, we realize that there's different ways that they could bind. For example, if we have the reaction A plus B goes to C plus D, we could imagine that maybe A would have to bind first, and then B, or maybe B binds first and then A. But what we find is that for some enzymes, it really doesn't matter which one binds first. This is called random binding, as it's shown in the first example that I have on the screen. Random binding means it doesn't matter. Now, some enzymes bind substrates randomly, as I'm showing you here. But a lot of enzymes do what's called ordered binding. That means that either A must bind first, or B must bind first. Now that model or that mechanism is significant. And the reason it's significant is it's probably the best illustration that I can give you for the Koshland induced fit model. Because what order binding tells us that is, is that if one of these must bind first before the other one does, that means then that the binding of the first one is actually changing the shape of the binding site for the second one. Because if the second one tries to bind first, the change hasn't already happened, and that's why the second one can't bind first. So ordered binding reinforces the Koshland induced fit model. Now that might seem to cover all the territory, but there's actually a third model that enzymes use to catalyze reactions. And this one's kind of interesting, and it has a fun name. We call it the ping pong mechanism, and it's also called a, order, a double displacement reaction. But the point is the same. The ping pong mechanism um, is an enzyme that actually exists 
in two covalently different states. That means that the enzyme is actually physically binding to something and causing a change. And we'll see this happen in the next slide. Now, this illustrates a reaction of A plus C going to B plus D. And we're seeing it split into two reactions. All right. In this reaction, what's happening is A is starting out with an oxygen on it. And in the reaction of A to B, the oxygen is being replaced by an amine. So we see this happening. And where is the amine coming from? The amine is coming from the enzyme. So the enzyme is carrying the amine, and it's carrying it to A. So when A interacts with the enzyme, the enzyme swaps the amine that it's carrying for the oxygen that's on A. So on the right side of the top equation, we see that A has become B because it now has an amine, and the enzyme has grabbed the oxygen. It no longer has an amine. So I've colored it with green so that you can see that. In the second part of the reaction, C, which has an amine, is interacting with the enzyme that now has an oxygen. And when that happens, they trade places. C becomes D, where D has a double bond to the oxygen. And the enzyme has become uh, linked to an amine. Right? So the enzyme has returned to its original state. So by this ping pong mechanism, the enzyme is continually going from amine to oxygen to amine to oxygen. And depending upon which state it's in, it determines which of the substrate it binds and swaps with. Now, this type of reaction that I just described to you is a common reaction that's used by enzymes called transaminases. Transaminases are enzymes that do just what I've described. They swap oxygens for amines. And this is a very important reaction in the metabolism of amino acids. Because amino acids get their amines, in some cases, by the reaction that you see on the top. They start out with a double bonded oxygen, and they become an amine. A really good example of this is the, the molecule alpha-ketoglutarate in the citric acid cycle. Alpha-ketoglutarate can become glutamic acid if the oxygen on it is swapped for an amine. In this way, the cell can make an, uh, a, an amino acid that it might need uh, because of this mechanism. On the other hand, we might have the situation where glutamic acid, or even another amino acid, is needed for energy. People that go on low-carb diets, for example, don't have a lot of carbohydrates, but they're not starving to death because they're eating plenty of protein. Proteins providing amino acids. And amino acids provide energy as a result of what I'm showing you here. The lower left reaction has an amino acid that has the amine replaced by a double bonded oxygen. So imagine, if you will, that the amino acid on the lower left side is actually aspartic acid. Aspartic acid can be converted by swapping its amine with an oxygen into oxaloacetate. And oxaloacetate can be oxidized in the citric acid cycle. So this transaminase reaction is important both for making amino acids and also for metabolizing amino acids for energy. The last thing I want to talk about here are the classifications of enzymes. Enzymes, according to a systematic scheme that has been developed by the EC Commission, the Enzyme Commission, have broken all reactions that enzymes catalyze into six categories. And this six-category scheme is used to organize and name all enzymes that are in biology. The first uh, scheme, a category scheme is that of an oxidoreductase. That is, an oxidation and a reduction is happening in the reaction that's catalyzed by the first uh, category of enzymes. In this case, you can see malate, which is shown on the left, that is being oxidized. It's donating its electrons to NAD to form oxaloacetate and NADH. So oxidoreductases will always have transfers of electrons and will always have an electron carrier involved. You can see the NAD and the NADH here. The second category of enzymes are those called transferases. And transferases grab a part of one molecule and move it to another. So we can see here, for example, that we're starting with glucose. We're taking a phosphate off of ATP, and we're putting it onto glucose. This enzyme, hexokinase, catalyzes the first reaction in glycolysis, and it's a transferase.
The next reaction involves hydrolases, and as the name would suggest, these enzymes use water to break bonds. So we can see in the schematic reaction here, a molecule on the left that has a peptide bond is actually combining with water to break that peptide bond. That's what happens with a serine protease, for example. Water is being used to split a peptide bond. In the fourth category, we have enzymes called lyases. And a lyase is an enzyme that uses a non-hydrolytic, meaning no water, non-oxidative way of breaking bonds. So on the left, we see, for example, isocitrate. The enzyme isocitrate lyase, which is found in plants, breaks this six-carbon molecule into a two-carbon piece called glyoxylate and a four-carbon piece called succinate. Because water is not involved, and because there is no oxidation involved, this uh, reaction is a lyase. The fifth category of enzyme is an isomerase. And isomerases are enzymes that catalyze rearrangements without doing other, anything else to the structure of the molecule that they're acting on. So in this case, we see another reaction from glycolysis. The enzyme converts glucose 6-phosphate, which is a sugar with a phosphate on it, to fructose 6-phosphate which is a different sugar with a phosphate on it. But all that has happened has been simply a rearrangement of the molecule. That's an isomerase. The last category of reaction are those of ligases. And ligases are molecules that put things together. So instead of breaking things apart, uh, ligases are making covalent bonds to join things together. So in this case, we're seeing ATP energy being used to join urea and bicarbonate to make urea one carboxylate. Ligases join things together. Well, we've seen in the reactions here that enzymes have some pretty amazing abilities in terms of flexibility for catalyzing reactions, flexibility as they affect the mechanism that they use to catalyze things, and we've also learned about the different categories of enzymes that are there. In other lectures, I will talk about the ways that enzymes become inhibited. <laughs>